Okay, so thank you everyone for coming. Um, my name is Mike Ewald with the Energy Justice Network, and we're um, graced with the presence of Scott Portslein, who's done massive amounts of incredible work on reactor security issues over the years. I'm going to turn it over to Scott um, to share a screen and give a presentation here on sabotage and terrorism risks at nuclear reactors and what we can do to make sure that we have more um, safe and secure um, nuclear power until we make sure that nuclear power is no longer a thing. Um, so thank you, Scott, for um, presenting here, and I'll turn it over to you. You're welcome, and thank you all. I decided to uh, do this webinar because I saw some great points being made on a Facebook discussion on Mike Ewald's page. I've researched this topic since 1984, and I want to just give you an overview and some pretty interesting things that you wouldn't expect, kind of shocking, real-world events that are occurring and the threats are very troubling, actually. So we're going to talk about modern threats and the various categories of attacks. And I'll show you some actual events which occurred, including crimes involving nuclear materials. When it comes to security regulations, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission certainly has room for improvements. So we're going to take a look at the NRC shortfalls for addressing known weaknesses and vulnerabilities. Then I'll talk about what activists can do and recommend some things to consider as a security activist. And after that, there'll be time for discussion. Here in Harrisburg, we know terrorists can be anywhere. So men associated with Ramsey Yosef, he was the mastermind of the World Trade Center bombing in 1993. Some of those men trained only 30 miles from Three Mile Island. And there in the bottom right-hand corner, you can see red TMI, the location, and then the training camp 30 miles away marked in the blue circle. So terrorists can be anywhere. That's the point of showing that. And when they were at the training camp during the weekends, this is right before they bombed the World Trade Center, they did a nighttime assault on an electrical substation for practice. It was a mock assault. That was as if they were training to attack a nuclear plant. And then they sent a letter to the New York Times after they bombed the World Trade Center that they were going to attack nuclear targets with 150 suicide soldiers. And that's what really brought me out of my shell, so to speak, where I had quite a bit of knowledge already on nuclear plant security vulnerabilities, but I didn't see any need to go public yet, because sometimes if you go public too soon, you're a pariah. Al-Qaeda was here at Three Mile Island during the summer of 2001. This is what they would have seen at the entrance. This is three days before the attack. There's no audio that goes with this. Right there goes a truck, and the car is passing into Three Mile Island. There's no guard posted there, and the vehicle barrier is open. That truck could have turned in there and delivered a bomb within a couple hundred feet of the nuclear reactor, which would have, uh, if it was large enough, would have caused a disaster. We also know that Al-Qaeda trained to cause meltdowns. Fox News has learned U.S. intelligence discovered that Al-Qaeda trainees have practiced taking over nuclear power plants and causing meltdowns. So there was some speculation where nuclear plants targeted on 9-11, and they had considered that when they first started planning for some sort of attack, but they decided against it for fear that it would get out of control. So let's look at some of the modern threats. I live close to two transportation routes that go through Harrisburg for nuclear waste. One would be high-level nuclear waste spent fuel rods, which the military waste does pass through this area now. High-level waste has not started yet. So I live 700 feet from these two routes, and I get to see a lot of things. In fact, just last week, I saw two trucks of low-level waste coming down on 81, one right behind the other. I didn't determine whether or not they were speeding. I was going the other way, but they, everything looked fine to me. But that's the first time I saw two trucks back to back, and I'm not so sure that's a good idea. Here's another modern threat. This high level nuclear waste is continually emitting radiation. Gamma rays and X rays are constantly escaping the protective shielding. The cask will be loaded onto a truck or a train. It's like transporting an X-ray machine that's stuck in the on position and then paraded through your town. And you 
won't know when they're coming to town because no one's going to tell you and hundreds, maybe thousands are coming. One day, I worry this is going to be something we hear on the news about a fiery crash of a spent fuel shipment and the emergency evacuation of people living nearby. So this is a dramatization of what that report might sound like. This story is turning into a major event because we now know that the truck was carrying spent nuclear fuel from a nuclear plant in the northeastern United States. There has been increased levels of radiation, but authorities are not telling us the level of severity and blame vastly different measurements taken near the scene of the crash. We have also been told by several witnesses that they believe they saw a missile or some kind of projectile hit the truck before it crashed. That cannot be confirmed, but if it is true, it would be the first act of terrorism on a nuclear fuel shipment. Yeah, to me, that represents a nightmare situation that we're going to be facing in the future. And we need some activists to uh, get involved with that because all of us are getting pretty old now. I'm one of the youngest I know of with the security issues, and I'm 62 years old. So if you think it's too soon to worry about rocket propelled grenades, we just had one show up at the airport in Allentown, Pennsylvania. The use of the rocket propelled grenades at a nuclear plant goes back to 1982 in France. And what happened was there was five anti-tank rockets were fired at the plant while it was still under construction. One passed through the opening, striking a crane inside. Another hit the outside of the main reactor building. And another one hit a metal crane outside. The other two hit the wall of the steam generator building and the perpetrators escaped. Here's another modern threat. Another very odd case, Andrea. This is, uh, according to the FBI, two men in New York State who were plotting to develop a device that sounds like something out of science fiction that they could use to aim x-rays at uh, people and harm them. So what happened there was a 52-year-old man in a federal court in New York, he's a self-professed member of the KKK, he was sentenced to 30 years for plotting to build an industrial x-ray machine, and it was designed to shoot out a directed beam of lethal radiation. It would have been power enough to kill from a distance. And he was going to set it up in a van outside of Muslim mosques and schools and turn it on. He called it Hiroshima on a light switch. This is the Westinghouse nuclear headquarters near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And the Justice Department says a Russian military officer stole login credentials of workers at Westinghouse. Westinghouse provides plant design services and fuel to customers. John Delano has more. Ivan Segarevich Yamakov is accused of creating a fake website to mimic Westinghouse's, then spearfishing to attract employees to respond thereby stealing their login credentials. Seven Russian military hackers were indicted in 2018 using a bogus website that tricked some employees into handing over their passwords. And they accomplished this with the spear phishing email scheme. Westinghouse employees were sent an email from the bogus network and the hackers altered one letter in a clickable link to disguise the trick. So the G was changed to a Q, and you can see how easily you could overlook that when you're clicking on what looks like a legitimate email. When employees clicked the link and signed in, the bogus site stole their username and password, and then it connected them to the real Westinghouse website. That way, no suspicions were raised. Now, the economic losses could be high because... They would have to, Westinghouse would have to check all their drawings and schematics and circuits to be sure that nothing was changed because just one change to a, a certain safety system could prove disastrous at a nuclear plant. And the most disturbing aspect of this was that the cyber attack came from the parking lot. The spies rented a car and assembled a computer network in the trunk. The operation was described as on the ground cyber espionage, and that represented an advancement in espionage that shook the Department of Homeland Security. So the new threat is using drones as radiological dispersion devices, and ISIS has been observed trying to buy crop dusting type drones. The Prime Minister of England said ISIS plans to use drones to spray nuclear materials over Western cities. That's just a couple of years ago. 
Here's another threat. Someone placed three packets of radioactive materials inside an administrator's chair at a clinic. Three more to give you an example of what goes on. Someone put strontium-90 in the rear pocket of a female worker at the Quad City nuclear plant. And I've seen uh, a report where somebody at a waste facility, just ordinary household waste, picked up a shiny piece of metal, put it in a shirt pocket. Here it turned out to be cobalt-60, and he burned the nipple right off of him. The next day, you know, it started to deteriorate, and within a week it was gone. So another t event was college student attempted to poison his former girlfriend and her roommate by placing iodine-125 into their food. And then the same thing with two men plotted to kill three local officials by planting radium-226 in their cars and food. So as Mike said, before this started, when he went to Penn State, there's a hundred or hundreds of sources of radiation all over that campus in different laboratories. At the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, one of the employees or staffers tried to plant viruses on the computers with the spear phishing emails. Now we're going to talk about the different categories of nuclear plant attacks. I came up with six of them a long time ago. Commando, vehicle, boat, aircraft, insider, and cyber. But recently, because of all the drones and it's so different with the availability and the technical aspects of what they can do, I really think there should be a seventh category now, just drones alone. Drones like this are now widely available, and someone seems to be flying them over France's nuclear power stations. Some initially suspected that Greenpeace might be responsible. In 2012, an activist from the environmental group flew a paraglider over this nuclear plant in southeast France. The group says it is not behind these latest drone flights, but is worried about them. It is apparent that you can enter the airspace around these French nuclear power stations, get in and get out without anyone intervening. It's a real breach of security. 2014, drones probed all 19 of France's nuclear reactor sites. And in just the space of six hours, there were five drone incursions that placed the government on high alert. The guards describe a triangle of white lights and a large red light. And the flights utilize complex and expensive helicopter-like drones with powerful engines, some big enough for explosive, yet the drones are too small to be detected with conventional radar. And the drone shines a spotlight, possibly linked to a camera, which throws intermittent beams of light onto the target. France doesn't want anybody to be taking those type of precise images to provide surveillance or someone to formulate a plan to attack the nuclear plant. The drones could not be intercepted, and the soldiers are authorized to shoot down the drones except when they're over the plants. And the concern there is that they could cause damage. But it's funny how the United States says our plants can withstand a fully loaded jet. No drones have ever been shot down, and investigators could not uncover who was flying the drones. Drones can provide real-time overhead surveillance to terrorists, knowing where the guards are or what's moving around at the plant. A medium-sized drone could carry an explosive charge big enough to damage the spent fuel pools. And that, that's a really nasty concern. And I really don't like to talk too much about the spent fuel pools. Here at Three Mile Island, that remains to be a huge threat. And yet they're doing away with the emergency siren network. So there could be an airplane crash into that tonight and everyone would sleep through the night not knowing it because there'd be no sirens going off that uh, we used to have available. In the prisons, they're experiencing drone drops where uh, the drones are dropping cell phones, drugs, and weapons, so forth. And some of the prisons have drone detection, which can uncover where the launching point was in hope to try to stop other attacks. I did skip a line there where it says that drones can deliver weapons and explosives to a commando team inside the plant. Regarding the drones, this is a tiny URL I made for everybody, and I'll have it again at the end so you can copy it down. But there's a great article about the drones that flew over the Limerick nuclear plant and Palo Verde, which is our largest nuclear complex of nuclear power plants in Arizona. And Ed Lyman's quoted in there as saying about how the NRC is being so reluctant to modernize and come up with a defense against these drones. And then this other uh, article I recommend reading, I just found today, 
And man was sentenced to prison for using drones to drop bombs near his girlfriend's home. So if somebody's going to do that, there's crazy enough people, even on a whim, might do that at other important facilities. Now we're going to talk about the, the security zones and a little bit about the strategy of what nuclear plants do to secure their plants. The outside area is the owner-controlled area. That isn't really designed to stop intruders. They, they really want to stop them inside the red area. Now, that's not my plans. That's their plans. Security really gets beefed up for the vital areas of the plant. And, of course, there's always this discussion of what really is vital and what is secondary, but uh, they, they never resolve that to uh, the satisfaction of everyone. And now we're going to talk about commando assaults. After the 9-11 attacks, nuclear plants were required to make a small increase to the number of guards and to build guard towers, which thankfully I've been after them for years to do that. And the guards still work too many hours in a week. And so they may go for a month working 70, 80, 90 hours a week and they burn out. And so they have to replace guards all the time. They just can't handle that. After 9-11, also the NRC had the plants put in new sniper's nest and defensive positions inside some of the protected uh, buildings or the more vital buildings. But the shortcomings, uh, oh, you can see on the screen there, it says how they added more concertina wire. But there's still shortcomings, and that is the electronic detection systems and the cameras can easily be overcome by trained adversaries. And if I told you how, you'd be shocked and you would understand just how easy it really is. The record time to simulate causing meltdown by a commando style attack is 15 seconds. Nuclear plants are not required to guard against multiple teams of attackers. And they're not required to have guards posted at the entrance. So I thought that security upgrades would give the site protection officers the upper hand against uh, commando attackers, one team of commando attackers. However, the new detailed aerial images that are found on the Internet have changed that. We'll talk about that more a little bit later. And the vehicle bomb continues to be the most utilized form of a terrorist attack. If a bomb is close enough or powerful enough, the ground shock waves, not the waves that go through the air, but the ground shock waves overcome the earthquake proofing measures so that the pipes that go from the reactor building to the turbine building and so forth, those buildings shift at different time and at a different rate. That'll fracture those pipes and cause a loss of coolant accident. I got interested in going public, as I said, 1993, because of this vehicle intrusion. We're talking about vehicle bombs. This fellow named Pierce and I went right through the uh, open front entrance. He crashed through a fence and then into the turbine building door. He crashed right through it. And so the chairman of the NRC at that time said that he just came in and he didn't untie the Gordian knot. He just crashed right through it, something that no one expected. But I certainly did because I knew how bad things were down there. And when it comes to vehicle bombs, the issue is setback distances. So here we're looking at an overhead image of a nuclear plant on the west coast. On the left, we see the distance of 475 feet to that road. That's a public road. And to the interstate, it's 675 feet. So a large bomb from the highway, the interstate, it, it, the truck would never even leave the interstate. There's no way security could find it. A large bomb could have caused a meltdown at the San Onofre nuclear plant. And I can say that now because it's shut down. But I was threatened with prison under the Patriot Act by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission if I talked about that. So I believe now that the setback distances are sufficient to guard against what size bombs are being used around the world, the largest that are being used. And we have the boat attack scenarios. They can destroy the water intake systems, deliver commandos or a bomb. And the watercraft barriers are not required at nuclear plants. So this is Three Mile Island as seen from a satellite image. These are the old blurry images. And right in the middle of the TMI exclusion zone is a boat. So here's a photo of type of watercraft barriers used at uh, important facilities. And the Navy uses these. Here's another one, an enhanced watercraft barrier. And we're going to talk about manned aircraft. Nuclear plants are vulnerable. It doesn't matter what they tell you. In fact, I'd rather they do tell people that uh, they're, they're not vul vulnerable until they figure out a way to defend against them. 
Al-Qaeda threatened to crash an explosive-laden aircraft into TMI right after the 9-11 attacks. And F-16 jets orbited TMI that evening for protection. The bottom line is we still can't prevent a 9-11 style attack against nuclear reactors. And this, this is a very, I got to get the quote so people can use it, uh, the source for this. It came from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. The most well-considered plans and procedures do not guarantee that the personnel will survive an aircraft impact. So what they came up with is a plan to leave the immediate area, except for a few uh, absolutely necessary employees, and they would assemble at a predefined area outside of targeted area, the attack area. They were to extinguish lights, just like we're going back to, you know, uh, World War II defenses rather than 2020. And they are supposed to get their water inventories up, the makeup water, and start filling those tanks if they're down. And the same with the, the water heaters that uh, have to heat the water so that when you inject it into the reactor, it doesn't shock the system. Let's talk about the insider threat. And that was the one I was the most interested in from the beginning. I forget who did the study, but I'm sure the NRC was involved. Who would sabotage a nuclear plant? What type of people and so they came up with some of these groups like the religious or political zealots, disgruntled employees, environmental extremists. You can read them there for yourself. And the number one was the religious or political zealots is who they thought would attack a nuclear plant. This is the descending order of who they suspected the most. In the real world, turned out to be disgruntled employees. And I always thought that was just unbelievable. And they have by far damaged or disabled equipment more than any other characters as profiled. Message from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to every nuclear power plant in the country. Beware of sabotage from within by disgruntled employees. The Washington Post reports the NRC warned that such potentially dangerous insider attacks are on the increase and said that most plant managers are not fully prepared to cope with them. So why did he say that? What was going on? Well, in 1979, in fact, this is only 10 days after the Three Mile Island accident began, Someone poured sodium hydroxide into 64 new fuel assemblies, and it turned out that it was two reactor operators who were protesting lax nuclear safety, and they wanted to show that malicious attackers had time to perform even more destructive actions. Then in Turkey Point, this is April 2006, someone drilled holes into pipes. The pipes are part of a safety system used to maintain reactor pressure at the McGuire, North Carolina plants, December 97, all eight reactor door airlock seals are slashed. That's uh, to prevent uh, particles from going outside the reactor while workers are going in. Uh, the emergency diesel generators were sabotaged at San Onofre 2012. The engine coolant was poured into the oil reserve. The FBI investigated to no avail. So a lot of these acts aren't really designed to disperse radiation. They're just to get back at the company. But a, a few of them have been. I'm familiar with maybe about 10 of them, where if there had been a serious problem, these systems, backup systems, would not have been available, including someone pouring glue into a backup control panel. They poured the glue into the key switches so that the operators would not have been able to bring the plant back under control. So insider sabotage is still the very worrisome problem since it's considered unstoppable if perpetrated by a determined individual. Now that the cyber threats are realistic, that's almost like being an insider. There's already been more than 150 acts of insider sabotage at U.S. plants, and there's still no two-man rule as was proposed in the 1970s because that would double the pay needed for the workforce. And if you combine the outsider attack with insider assistance, it really ratchets up the dangers. All the problems with uh, security being uh, made public started here in 1975 at Three Mile Island, where these two guards met with Ralph Nader and told him that it'd be easy for a lone saboteur to gain entry into the operating reactor and hold it over the country's or area's head. That's the quote from the one guard. Ralph Nader in 1975 went before the nation and said that nuclear plant security is a sham and he called for a congressional investigation. Uh, the next year, somebody at Three Mile Island drove into the plant and he climbed on top of the reactor building somehow or got to the top of the reactor building and that's where they heard him singing. He was never caught. 
And then the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, with all the pressure and things going on wrong, uh, they decided in 1976 to do their own special inspections of 43 nuclear power plants. Well, that was all that we were running at that time. And weaknesses were found at each one. The result of that inquiry that Nader requested was the study that was called Nuclear Plant Security Inadequate at Best. And one of the chapters was why has the NRC program for security and nuclear then power plants Then when the Three Mile Island accident happened, there was suspicions of sabotage. I could go on for hours about that, actually, but because I've, I've done 44,000 pages of research on this topic alone. The President's Commission did ask the FBI to do a sabotage investigation by an insider because of the things that they by found an insider, with the NRC the had not been they reporting. Found with the NRC and this was from the Los Alamos National Laboratory talking about the security status at Three Mile Island. Look at the middle quote there where it says, actually, there was very poor protection against the sabotage actions of the insider. So to this day, I still have a lot of evidence and believe that sabotage was responsible for the beginning of that problem. Last year, the nuclear plant at Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania had a nuclear problem. This year, it's got a security problem. An enterprising reporter from a local paper penetrated the plant's security as though it never existed. Al Johnson has the details. The big story? How a 26-year-old reporter on his first assignment using phony identification got a job as a guard on Three Mile Island. Robert Kapler's security badges allowed him to go everywhere. He had a camera hidden on him. He got into and took a picture of the control room of Reactor 2, the site of the accident last March. He said the door was left unlocked. Kapler said it was easy to get the job, easy to be an imposter. Three Mile Island as a nuclear facility is, is wide open for sabotage. It was wide open before the March 28th accident. And for all intents and purposes, it's wide open for sabotage right now. That was in 1980. The newspaper headline that it showed in there said, TMI, Paradise Island for the Saboteur. The cyber threat, one of the researchers for IBM was told it would be impossible to hack into a nuclear plant. But he ended up saying it was one of the easiest penetration tests he'd ever done. And within a week, they were controlling, they had control of the nuclear power plant. Cybersecurity is such a challenge because it's never ending technical challenges and the expenses can be quite high. The types of equipment that need to be protected are listed there. Even walkie talkies is part of cyberspace. These are three cyber requirements I asked for, but uh, they've never acted on them. Situation awareness, I think, is very important. Order each nuclear reactor licensees to report any cyber troubles within 15 minutes of its discovery. The reason is, if there's a concerted effort to cause nuclear accidents around the country, they could head off some of those uh, early on, hopefully, with the situation awareness. And also, that they'd have to change the passwords when reactor licensees get a hold of some of the equipment. They use the default passwords for this equipment, but they should all have to change the passwords. And then finally, when a reactor licensee is going to lose his job or learns of his pending dismissal, there should be a change to his capabilities to log on to the plant, passwords and so forth. Because some of these people actually put Trojan horses into these systems so that when they leave, they lock up some controls just to get even. So what can activists do? One time I attended a NRC security meeting and everyone laughed when the presenter was saying that you can't rent a plane like you can rent a truck. Well, I knew that wasn't true. And I went up and talked to another NRC commissioner, told her how the airplanes could attack the nuclear plants and there's nothing anybody could do. But she insisted that the control towers could see what was going on. And then she just turned and walked away from me. So what did I do? I flew over Three Mile Island with a rented airplane. And then this is the chairman of the NRC, Ivan Selen. You can rent an airplane, you can get a, I suppose you could get a suicide pilot to fly an airplane and have a fair chance that you could fly the airplane into the, uh, into the power plant and cause a lot of damage. You would probably not even have to put any explosives on it. This is another thing I've done as an activist. Uh, there was a, a report that basically became a how-to book to fly an aircraft into a nuclear plant to cause a meltdown. And what was the best way to do that? 
and I found it on two government websites and had that removed. It was the only time I saw the government respond within 30 days. And I think it happened because it was kind of obvious that it needed to be corrected. And I carbon copied about 15 other governmental leaders describing the problem. That was in the Homeland Security Wire. The newest aerial images reveal too much detail. I said earlier we talked about that. So you can see in that blue circle, that's a guard shack, and that's where they would come up out of that turbine building onto the roof. In the red circle is a guard, and in the yellow is a sniper's nest. The green circle is a communication device. And what I'm not showing you would shock you. This was an online report where CNN followed up on what I had said. These are the old satellite images, and you can see this nuclear plant. It's quite blurry. This is the newest quality. It's a high quality resolution with a different angle where we can see more of the 3D layout of the plant. Scott Portsline is taking us on a tour of U.S. nuclear power plants on the Internet, where high-resolution satellite imagery is conveniently linked with even higher-resolution aerial photography. It's a tour he's afraid terrorists are taking right now. What we're seeing here is a guard shack. This is a communications device for the nuclear plant. This particular building is the air intake for the control room. I look at this and just say, wow. How hard is it to find this image online? No, I found it in five minutes' time. Some of the images are of the Three Mile Island nuclear plant, but officials there say much of their security is not visible, and they say they're not concerned. Our security programs are designed and tested to defend against a threat that has insider information, even more information than is available on the Internet. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission says old, low-resolution images were not a concern, but it is reviewing the new, more detailed imagery. We are taking another look because the security of nuclear power plants is something we take very seriously. I looked at these. They, they were extraordinarily impressive. Terror expert Brian Jenkins does not believe Portsline or CNN is telling terrorists anything they don't already know. They have used online satellite imagery to plan the Mumbai attacks last November, for example. Although the nuclear industry has spent $2 billion improving security since 9-11, Jenkins believes the images of the plants should be blurred. Mystery is an important component of security. This takes away that uncertainty. If I were on the defending side, I certainly would not want to see anything that detailed available to, to anyone. And TMI, this is another thing I did as, as an activist, TMI removed a guard from the front entrance in the winter of 2000. There had been a guard before there. And so as, on behalf of Three Mile Island Alert, I filed a petition for rulemaking. And if you don't know what that is, that's one tool that you have to request the NRC to make a new regulation. But I don't have much faith in that because on 40, more than 40 occasions, the NRC broke the rules, their own rules for handling that petition for rulemaking and finally made it disappear again against their own rules. Concerning lost and stolen radioactive materials, I used to see the reports come across the NRC's website, and I'll show you that in a second, of uh, things that were lost or stolen or even found. Usually I would call up whatever city this was happening and talk to a reporter at the newspaper and say, do you know you have a dangerous radioactive material missing in your city? No, I didn't. Tell me about it. So it was really easy for me to generate dozens of articles, and most of the time I didn't want my name in the articles. This was the Boston Globe, and you can look at that sometime, too, but a very dangerous amount of iridium was missing for a while. This is the website if you want to do something like that to find out what's going on. They don't put the security reports up anymore with any details, and that's actually applaudable. I'm glad that they don't. So you go to the NRC.gov, look for the event reports at the bottom of the page, and that'll take you to another link there in the bottom of the screen with event notification reports, and you can look for things that are going on and the loss and solo materials. I kept a database for about four years, and then I stopped. This is a Superman drone that Greenpeace flew into the Bouget nuclear plant in France.
So now here's the final things, recommendations, guidelines that I suggest to everybody. With security issues, request a meeting with the NRC behind closed doors. They say they welcome that. Meet with your federal representative or senator. Develop a relationship with a major news producer or a correspondent, which I was able to do. And when going public, strike a balance between a cautious disclosure, only give part of the information to prove your point, and don't give away the keys to the kingdom. And then lastly, I'm sorry to say this, but everybody knows it, you have to embarrass the NRC or the industry in the news media to try to make some changes happen. So as a security activist, you got to be really careful how you embarrass them. Don't break the laws. Don't cross boundaries or test security. And I understand, you know, that people do cross those boundaries. But for me, as a security person, I feel that that's uh, working against myself, actually. So don't reveal all the details of vulnerability to the public. I just pointed that out. Don't repeatedly draw attention to a security problem. The public will resent that approach and accuse you of aiding the terrorists. Do file a petition for rulemaking with the NRC, and then you have something to go to the media with once again. The FBI warned that Al-Qaeda looks at websites concerning nuclear power plants, so be careful what you put on your website. You might become a person of interest and a target for federal surveillance, which happened to me. You might be harassed by the very people who are surveilling you, which happened to me. And you got to watch out. This happened, too. You got to watch out for a reporter promising to do a story who is actually gathering intelligence on you. And the idea there is that uh, uh, an activist wants to say all he knows and uh, all these plans and different things. And, and so the reporter makes a welcome depository to place all your knowledge and so forth. So what happened when that, that occurred to me, there was a repeated contact every other day from this reporter. She was sending me baiting emails about some rotten things the government was being accused of. And I just never once responded to any of them because I knew what was going on. Uh, real close to the end now. Consider that there could be unintended consequences. When this report came out, and it was also national news on the television about the location of uh, radioactive materials at universities, at hospitals, and so forth, how you could find exactly what room they're in, what drawer they're in, in a cabinet. Uh, the NRC shut down their website to remove all that material. Now, we had been after them for years before, but it wasn't until we embarrassed them in the public that they shut down their website, and that was unintended. Or the NRC might water down a proposed rule. In this proposed rule that the NRC was working on, they wanted to pay attention to the entrances at nuclear plants so that law enforcement and fire trucks and things could get there. I made the mistake of pointing out, well, if you do that at Three Mile Island, then you have to control that bridge. Well, they didn't want to do that, so they dropped that whole portion of the rule. You might be mistaken for a person having safeguarded or classified information. That happened to me. And the, clue, the key to look for is when somebody from the NRC calls you and starts talking really friendly about another topic that you're interested in. He's trying to loosen your lips.